can't see anything. Okay, now we're live. Hey, there you go, everybody. Well, I can't see anything. Here, let's try it this way. Right. Kind of, not really. Not really. Anyway, we're going to be going live today for Lakes and Libations Luxury Travel Magazine. We have to be sort of quiet because of everybody on the boat. If you can't hear us, we're going to underscore this with uh, Burbage and Deacon Green soon. With Gage Marine, we're going on the last mailboat ride of the season here in an orange Geneva Lake, but located in Lake, Lake Geneva, Geneva, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. On my left, we have beautiful, vivacious, and wonderful Miss Kira Peterson. And to my right is Randy Weckerly. Yeah, and we're really, really happy to be celebrating on the boat. The boat is full. We have to be quiet, so we're going to sit and wait for the, the, the boat ride that has been going on, as we just found out, since uh, about 1876. Yep. When people started getting mail on the lake because they just couldn't get here. Um, it's, I learned some things I did not What know. did you learn, Miss Karen? I learned about that. Well, I knew that they had a train, but I didn't know that there was yeah. one located yeah. in Williams Bay. Yeah. Originally, people... Uh, Came to the lake from Chicago in about a three-hour train ride, which started back about 1875. Yeah, they still come. Here. Yeah, but back at that time, uh, they had to get around the lake by horse and buggy. So because horse, it was very no, and then steamboats. Yeah, I prefer the horse and buggy today, personally. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> long story short, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be filming the uh, mailboat uh, delivery pit personnel. We hope they don't fall in. They do wear uh, life jackets, as you can see. That if they do. Fall in. Uh, they're gathering down there now. Uh, that their life jackets, their their life jackets are uh, um, activated when they uh, uh, hit the water. And uh, we just have some late comers that are uh, coming on the ship. Sounds like yesterday. Yesterday. Well, we got uh -huh. people that we we want to make this best and good for everybody that visits Lake Geneva. Right. We love tourists that come to the city. Uh, people uh, come to walk around downtown. See the beauty. Yes. Um, in most of the cottages, what do we find out, Miss Kira, that uh, people live here year round, right? Oh, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> not at all. Half uh, only in the summer. It must yeah. be nice to have just a summer yeah. home. Typically, most of the people come up here, they're only up here for about 13 weekends at most. How but, much was that guy that the, has those parties, his summer parties? Well, we can't mention that, but there is somebody on a lake that. Uh, he brings in famous people to entertain, like Jay Leno, um, the Beach Boys. Yes. Uh, he has he gives away cars and Corvettes if people have the right key. And this is for his birthday. Yes, must so, be nice to have that kind of income. So for all of those people here in the lake that have a Corvette to give away, we uh, would gladly take it. Park illegally, and the police would be happy to do it. But that's about but it. we are about to leave, yep. so there we go. We are going to be quiet now. Yeah. And we're just going to flip the screen. Yep. We're so, going to show you a few minutes on the boat, and then we'll end this, and we'll come back on another live feed here in a few minutes when they start jumping the piers. And then we'll be quiet. Let's flip this. I can see. That'd be great. This is just so We got the lovely Riviera. Oh, we're moving. Hey, we are moving Goodbye, out here. Land. We'll see you in an hour. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Miss Kira is providing the three beeps to make sure we don't back into because anybody. Because we're, we're backing up. Yep. And that's what you're supposed to do on the boat. Yep. Um, over to the left, if you want to take a look, that's where you can come up during the day and uh, spend time on the beach. If not, there you Called go. It. Called it. <laughs> Those three beeps. Just are... in case somebody falls asleep, I'll toot the whistle once in a while to keep you on your toes. <laughs> Actually, the three blasts on the whistle there signifies to other boats around us that we're backing up, and I'll do that several times during the trip. Don't mean to startle you. If you are seated on the starboard side, now that's boat talk for the right side along the windows here, along the railings. Uh, please keep your hands, your heads, your elbows, your fingers, your feet, your cameras, anything else you value inside the windows and inside the railings. We get extremely close to the docks as we're making our deliveries and every once in a while we'll rub. Don't mean to do that, but the point is the pier poles will be right outside the windows. And you don't want to meet up with one of those sneaking out there. Also, in most instances, Paige is working quickly out in the dock. She doesn't have time to pick a landing spot. She's working with the mail, taking any outgoing mail that may have accumulated. We need to uh, uh, put the flag down, close the door. So she's going to spin around and leap back on any place, any way she can. If you're sticking out there, about the time she makes her leap, she'll mow you down. Stay out of her way. She's tough. <laughs> 
I would appreciate it if you put that blind up all the way. Because what's going to happen is the wind is going to blow it and then it's going to make a bunch of crashing noise. Thank you so much. All right, as Neil said, my, my name is Paige. I'll be your male jumper for today. A little bit about myself before we get going. I'm 17. I'm gonna. I'm a senior in high school at Badger High School here in Lake Geneva, and this is my first summer male jumping. Yes, I have fallen in, but only twice, and I'm hoping to keep it that way. <laughs> the tour off right away with that modern brick building behind the Riviera Beach. That is the Lake Geneva Public Library. This prairie style building was designed by Mr. James Dresser, a student of the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. The property along the shoreline is known as Library Park. Mr. George Sturges, an early summer resident, gave this land along with a cottage that once stood here to the city of Lake Geneva in 1894. Now that gift came with the stipulation that the property always be used as a public park. There's cottage served as the city's first library until this new building was completed in the 1950s. We'll see the site of the second George Sturgis home further down the shoreline. During the tour today we'll be pointing out many interesting and beautiful homes and estates. Some of these are remnants of a bygone era here in Geneva Lake, an era of elegance when this area was referred to as the Newport of the West. This was in reference to Newport, Rhode Island, the famous summer resort on the East Coast. The time period we'll be referring to is roughly between the years of 1870 and 1920, when the men who built these estates were at the forefront of Chicago's business and industry. As you will see, the development of the Geneva Lake area is closely tied to the growth of that prairie town today known as Chicago. summer home on the lake was built in 1870 on the site where that large tan home now stands. It was built in 1870 for Shelton Sturges. He and his brothers were business partners and each had summer homes in the area. The original mansion called Maple Lawn was torn down a decade ago and this new home was built in its place. Behind it off to the left is a large gray home called the Annex which was built in later years to house the overflow of guests and servants from the main house. The Annex is now called Acorn Manor. day here in Lake Geneva. Miss Kara and I are being very quiet. We're going to be coming pretty close to the first pier we're going to be delivering now. Acorn Manor is up on the hill. Absolutely ex exclusively beautiful. Look, and they have a new house. Yeah. New house going up? Yes. Yeah. 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 Come on, Paige, too. Paige is uh, getting ready to uh, jump. Jump? Today we have a, going along the lakeshore raising money for uh, Alzheimer's awareness. That's yeah. Kara. So a lot of people showed up in the park near the library. Library park. Uh, library park. Uh, a lot of people. Everybody wave. There you go. Most people walking along the lakeshore are participating in our annual Alzheimer's walk, and they are on the lakeshore pathway that runs all the way around the lake. We'll talk more about it. They're not trespassing. They're on a public right away. We'll talk about it later on in the tour. As you see the numbers on the end of the pier, that's a numbering system that goes all the way around the lake for about, what, 290 years? Yeah. Miss Kara? And, and that's, yeah, that's their address. So it's easy to locate. Uh, you're going to see that most of the piers are white with green canopies. They can be like any other green color, but they to keep tradition. Yep, and there's only one pier on the lake that is tan. As we're passing forward here, 
you're, we're passing a two-story home right on the water's edge, which was built back in 1879 as the base of a huge windmill that stood up on top of there. The windmill was very large. It had 40-foot long arms, and it was actually used to pump water out of the lake to irrigate Linden Lodge, which is the next property that we'll be seeing. The windmill stood up on that top of there until 1884, when one night late in August, the windstorm came through, tore the arms off, and they never did uh, repair it. Eventually took the mechanism down and converted it into a cottage. Now, you can't build that close to the water any longer. So if anything were ever to happen to that, then it would have to be rebuilt farther back. This group of homes we're now passing is known as the Geneva Manor. The manor is built on 37 acres of the Levi Z. Leiter Estate, which was known as Linden Lodge and dated back to 1879. The main mansion, which stood behind the subdivision's beach and park area, contained more than 30 rooms. Inside were 19 fireplaces, one of them even conveniently located in the master bathroom. Levi Leiter co-founded Field Leiter & Company, which in later years became known simply as Marshall Field & Company. His fortune was founded, however, on his real estate investments. Linden Lodge stood on this site until 1939 when the property was subdivided. Now you may have noticed so far that all the piers we've seen are painted white. Now there's no ruler regulation putting that into place. So we do get a lot of questions about Pier 20 up here and why it's painted that light tan color. It could be painted that color to match the house, but here at the cruise line, we like to say that they have given in to the pier pressure. <laughs> Warning, the jokes get worse. We know. No, not your first. Not my first cruise. That's fun now, isn't it? But I'm fun. I like this cruise because we get a lot closer. I it's know. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. We have an observer in the back out holding over the railing, having fun in the crowd. We're trying to keep them from jumping, but you know, this is what people do when they come on a boat. What? Take pictures? Take pictures and hang over the railing. So as a common tourist here at Lake, Lake Geneva, ma'am, do you enjoy this trip? I do, yes. Yeah? Yeah? There you go. Uh, there she is. Yeah. She did it. I love that. That's neat. I don't think I've ever seen that. You thought this was going to be dull. Is that cool? Look how pretty those willows are. Don't, oh, we're coming up to the Please don't lose your phone, but can I take a lot of pictures, Joanna? That would be awesome. That's great. Joanna, I asked you right now. Oh, oh. So when you go to when you that go down, handsome Victorian boathouse on the shoreline is one of the few remaining structures of an estate known as Snug Harbor. Snug Harbor was built in 1881 for Mr. and Mrs. George Sturges. George and Mary had nine children, so the large French chateau home with 15-foot ceilings on every floor suited them well. The home was located in the open area left of the boathouse and stood here until 1957 when it burned down due to an electrical short circuit. In 1919, Snug Harbor was purchased by John Borden, famous Arctic explorer and member of the family that owned the Borden Dairy Products Company. In 1947, the estate became known as Covenant Harbor Bible Camp, owned and operated by the Evangelical Covenant Churches of America. Today, Covenant Harbor Bible Camp and the Geneva Bay Center host many different groups, group gatherings, and other hostel programs throughout the year. This next group of homes we're going to be passing is known as the Geneva Bay Estates. It's built on the former site of a large and beautiful estate known as the Butternuts. The home was built in 1874 for Nathaniel Kellogg Fairbank. He was president of the NK Fairbank Company, which was Chicago's leading manufacturer of lard oil refined products. Now that's just a fancy name for soap. The Fairbanks Estate took up roughly the same area as the first three homes in the subdivision. Shortly after the home was completed in 1875, it burned to the ground. However, firemen, family, and servants were able to save the furnishings, the handsome wood trim, ornately carved mantelpieces, and even some of the staircases. 
Undeterred, Mr. Fairbank had work begin the following Monday morning to rebuild the home from its original plans. It stood here for the next 80 years and stayed in the Fairbank family for four generations until 1955 when, the pro when it was torn down and the property subdivided. In 1895, a five-hole golf course was added to the estate grounds. It was here on Mr. Fairbank's golf course that many of the millionaires living on the lake were first introduced to this relatively new game of golf. Later that year, they established the Lake Geneva Country Club that we'll see later in the tour. All of these homes on the lake shore and the land behind what, them, they, and all what? of the homes on the hillside ahead and all the land behind there, uh, it's all part of the old Waterhouse uh, estate. Most of these estates were very large and they included farms where they could raise produce and livestock to maintain themselves through the summer season. Remember this was winter and they needed objects on a relative town to get a quarter meal can to be pretty self-sustaining. Mr. Fairbank was very active in the early goings on out here with the help responsible for improving rail service in the area back in the 1880s. And also before it became the responsibility of the conservation department to stock the lakes with fish, Mr. Fairbank built his own fish hatchery at the west end of the lake near what's now Fontana and stocked the lake with German brown trout and rainbow trout. I wish I could. I wish. Yeah, may have. We have the MacGyver of the lake. It's a page. Go, girl. Here she comes again. Randy and Pete. I've got a double hook. Hook with the hooks. Going live worldwide. Wait. We expect a drink when we come back. Black Top, which is this white home right here with the red roof and chimneys, it's typical of the homes built during Lake Geneva's golden era. Black Top was built in 1881 for John T. Lester, who was a prominent member of the Chicago Board of Trade. In later years, the home was a summer residence of Montgomery Ward Thorne, a member of the family that founded the Montgomery Ward Department Store. Now, all these next six estate properties are especially interesting as they are currently, or were at one plant, all part of the Wrigley Estate. Under William and P.K. Wrigley, the family amassed vast business, sports, and real estate holdings. At the time of P.K.'s passing in 1977, the family's interests included the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company, the Chicago Cubs, Wrigley Field, the Wrigley Building in downtown Chicago, significant real estate holdings in Phoenix, Arizona, and most of Catalina Island off the coast of Southern California. The first home on the Wrigley Complex is called North Woodside and was constructed in 1876 for General Henry Strong, who was president of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. <coughs> In later years, North Woodside was owned by an inventor named Olaf T. Bender. Mr. T. Bender's claim to fame was the invention of the sanitary milk bottle cap, that little cardboard cover on the old glass milk bottle. This seemingly trivial invention enabled Mr. T. Bender to retire here at the right old age of 26, a multi-millionaire. Dringley's bought this part of the estate in the 1970s to prevent subdivision of the property. Beers at 12. Still we'll be back. I back remember the extended Ridgeland family who have done lot to restore the estate and, as well as the grounds around it. And this uh, beautiful home has just been added. This home is called Shoreside. The next part of the complex it is, is an estate called Hill Dating back to the 1880s. From 1902 to 1927, Hillcroft was owned by Henry Litton, founder of the well-known Litton clothing stores in Chicago. From 1927 to 1965, the original home was P.K. Wrigley's main summer residence, later the guest house, until about 1980 when the property was sold. Since then, the new owners have torn down the original home and built this charming new home, <coughs> incorporating a lot of the classic architectural features that are common to some of the other buildings still on the property. Thank you. 
Hey, somebody let What's me know name? if you see a What's big splash back there. We'll <laughs> change direction here. Here, I got it. This next delivery is Green Gables, and Green Gables was P.K. Wrigley's main home at the time of his death in 1977. This is built on the site of the original Green Gables estate dating back to 1892 originally purchased by P.K. Wrigley's late father, William Wrigley Jr. in 1911. The original home stood there in 1955 when the family tore it down to make way for the construction of this one, completed around 1966. Recently, Green Gables was sold. The new owner uh, is an old, long-time area resident. He's completely remodeled the home, added the addition at the far end there with the dark windows, which encloses a swimming pool. I think you bring Dave out. Oh. This home is called Pool House. The pool House is about 20 years old. It was built on a tract of wooded property that was retained at the time that the rest of the estate uh, was liquidated back in the 1970s. At the edge of the wooded shoreline, right on the water's edge, you can see a barn-shaped building, which is the Wrigley Boat House. That's the winter quarters for the Wrigley fleet, numbering more than 20 boats. The beautiful home beyond the boathouse is called Lakewood, and Lakewood is only 10 years old, built by another Wrigley so grandchild funny. on the former site of the original Lakewood estate that dated all the way back to 1892, originally built for I Francis wish. Wagner, <laughs> president of the old Western Union Telegraph Company. The Brown building is a converted boathouse built in 1905 to house four steam powered yachts. As we round as we round this next small point of land, we're going to get a very good view of the fourth and final portion of the Wrigley Estate called Witchwood. And Witchwood was built in 1902 for Charles Hutchinson, trustee and treasurer at the University of Chicago, founder of the famous Art Institute many years ago. Behind the dock at Witchwood is the Wrigley 74 long private yacht, the Ada E, launched here in 1911 as the first gasoline-powered yacht to sail here on the lake. The home was originally a rambling three-story tall building with a definite English country influence and upon the Hutchinson's deaths in 1932, which was given in trust to the University of Chicago, serving as a study and retreat center until 1957, but which was then purchased by Clarence Mitchell, a banker from Chicago, who immediately uh, modernized the home by tearing off the top two floors. And he lived there for barely a year before selling it to the Wrigley's and there in the cold is Witchwood as it looks today. Witchwood is still owned by the Wrigley family and this completes the Wrigley estate. Originally it took up almost a mile of beautiful Geneva Lake shoreline. I like this house. Yeah, this is one of our the favorite the houses on the lake. Absolutely spectacular. It was constructed for Edward F. Swift, the son of Gustavus Swift. We've heard that uh, Dave Trevellino, chef of that the company uh, was established in 1885, TPC making it the first meat pack in Avenel of Batolmica, chef for the PGA Tour, is Gordon looking at purchasing this home for the Lakes of Life Nations team. We really appreciate that, Dave, and uh, now, we'll send the paperwork next week, right? Today, I would suggest getting them out because many uh, consider this next hall to be the uh, most In that house, we found out that they have not one, not two, but three. In 1906 uh, new Dave Trevellino Magic Oven Savings Bank. With the, the Dave Trevellino app. Was designed by the Olmsted brothers, sons of Frederick Hall Olmsted, who was Where all you have to do is put a piece of uh, meat in the oven, Some push of the a Olmsted button, projects and it has Central nothing Park to do with talent. City, the Capitol Not true. Of Washington, D.C. We hope Dave is watching this. In, in 1920, the estate uh, was purchased uh, we by we Walter W. Shaw, founder purchase. of the Yellow Taxi Cab Company in Chicago, and was renamed The Stunning. You're able to visit by the, the 1930s, corporate headquarters it was owned by Shaw's son in law, Daniel Jr., who was president of the Lawrence Hall uh, Company. The estate remained I in the Shaw and Peterson uh, family for nearly 80 years before it was there. sold to an investment advisor named Richard Driehaus. The estate is now called Glenworth Gardens. Isn't that beautiful? I love that house. My mom's been with that house. When you walk Are down you? to the Riviera, I call the Wolf Dock. That's exactly what I need. Here we go. Plaza, a fountain which were all located in the city several years ago by Mr. Treehouse. The fountain is actually a duplicate of the fountain that is in Central Park. Come on, Paige. This dark brown home with the white trim were approaching the building in 1898 
for Simeon B. Cheatman, owner of the S.B. Cheatman Brokerage Room of New York City. It's called Flower Side Inn. Now back to Mr. Dreehouse. He throws a party for himself at the end of every July. He erects a mammoth tent on the lawn, invite about a thousand of his closest friends for his annual birthday party. He also ends the night with a lavish fireworks display that can be seen anywhere around the lake. Now every year the party has a different theme. For example, when he turned 66, he had a Route 66 party, displaying classic cars on the front lawn. Also on the front lawn was a brand new Chevy Corvette, and that evening every guest got a key. And if your key started the car, you got to take it home that evening. Another Oprah moment. Now my buddy RJ in the back is a little upset with Mr. Dreehouse because he's never been invited to one of these parties, even though he is one of his closest neighbors. Right behind the rocks, you can see RJ's one bedroom, no bath, log cabin style. <laughs> he's saving up tips to buy a door pretty soon. Yeah. But, um... But right next to RJ, this home nestled back among the trees is called House in the Woods. It was completed in 1906 for Mr. A.C. Bartlett, a wholesale hardware distributor. Because the contractor, Richard Souter, was busy building the large Swift and Harris homes at the same time, special plans were made to complete this home on schedule. Mr. Souter went to Delvin, Wisconsin and borrowed a three-ring circus tent from P.T. Barnum Circus, who cut the circus there in the off-season. The tent was erected and heated so that construction can continue through the dead of winter. You see, it had to be finished on time because it was to be a surprise birthday present for Mrs. Bartlett in the spring. Lost page. As I say, turn around the page. <laughs> it's a fast turning line. This ranch style was built like around 1960 for Mrs. Jean Young Shaw. The late Mrs. Shaw was the widowed second wife of Walden Shaw of Wadsworth Hall that we saw a few moments ago. This is built on the original site of a beautiful estate that had been called Folly. Folly dated back to 1884. When it was built for the late Samuel Allerton, who, along with the Swifts and the Arbors, was in the meatpacking business in Chicago. Uh, Folly stood there until 1925. Say, if any of you have any mail that needs posting, you're carrying letters or postcards you want to get out today, give them to Paige before the end of the trip. She will include that in today's outgoing mail. Anything that's mailed on board the mailboat is actually end canceled with a special cancellation stamp. Now this can be heard the mailboat trip, so if you're carrying the electric bill with the postcard, or the uh, uh, gas bill with you today, or you have a postcard, and we do sell postcards like the snack bar if you want to send a message from the boat here this morning. Uh, pick up a postcard, get the address on it, turn it in. A word of caution, the cancellation is very large, so when you're putting the address on, keep it down low, give us some room, otherwise we'll cover it up. This uh, group of newer homes up along the ridge here are being built on property, or have been built on property that was first called Bonnie Bray, dating back to 1881. Up ahead, coming into view, is a large home with a red roof. That's the original Bonnie Bray ba mansion built for Jim, the late Judge Thomas F. Woodrow. In 1897, Bonnie Bray was purchased by Mr. and Mrs. Marshall Ryerson. And the Ryerson fortune was derived from lumber holdings throughout the United States. We've been told that the Ryersons had the very good fortune of owning one of the few lumber yards in Chicago that had survived the Chicago Fire of 1871. Consequently, during the reconstruction of Chicago after the fire, Ryerson lumber was in great demand. Through the years, the Ryerson were very generous supporters of many of Chicago's cultural institutions and museums, including the Art Institute, the Field Columbia Museum of Natural History, and the University of Chicago. spent their summers here at Bonnie Bray. They used to entertain many prominent people of that early era. The guest list here included such well-known names as Henry Ford, R.B. Firestone, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, the French Impressionist painter Claude Monet, and many others. 
it's off. Bonnie Bray was subdivided in 1955. Those bigger homes beyond there, and these newer homes on the water on the shoreline, they're all built on portions of the old Bonnie Bray estate. But up ahead, you can see a gray building right on the water's edge. That used to be the boathouse for the Bonnie Bray estate. That was the winter quarters for their large steamer. That was called the Hather, just like the Polaris that you saw earlier. The building was converted into a home in the 1930s, and numerous additions have been added through the years to make it more home-like. But that long, narrow part with the picture window that starts closest to the water, it extends back through the center, that's the original boat house. Mr. Palouse was founder of the Palouse Scale and Balance Company, which is still in business. At one time, Palouse Scales were used exclusively by the U.S. Postal Department. In later years, the property was owned by the Vic family from Vicksburg, Mississippi, founders of Vic Pharmaceuticals, famous for their cough drops and vapor rub. Just saying. <laughs> I was gonna say. Give it to a six-year-old that calms them down. Get a zero. This beautiful white brick home behind the retaining wall is called Tanglewood, and Tanglewood was built in 1937 for That's Nathan pretty. B. Hunt, a descendant of the founders of the Starlight Company of Harvard, Illinois, internationally known manufacturers of farm implements. How beautiful. Here comes Kate. Kate's coming. Kate. Kate. Is going. Jump. Ready. Got a jumper. Hopefully no splashes today. Age is in the building. <laughs> Don't work too hard. Work? What is that, Dave? Don't press too many buttons. Yeah, we can't wait to do this when we join you over in uh, uh, Honolulu during the holidays. Yes. And uh, we're gonna have we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of fun. So this is gonna be a lot of good stuff we do. Anyway, have a good time. I know you're gonna be cooking a lot of food for your members. See you later, Dave. fed or fed with uh, natural rainwater. There is no runoff from fields, so the lake does not have an oh, algae problem. That house. I've never seen that one before. You see that the shorelines really never flood because the one outlet to the lake controls the level it. controls the level to the lake, so there'll never be any flooding around Geneva Lake. Although this area is closer to Milwaukee, several factors were involved in the growth of Geneva Lake as a resort for Chicago's wealthy. 
First of all, in the 1870s, numerous men from Chicago came here to hunt and fish, and their love of this area convinced them that Geneva Lake would be a fine place to build a summer home. Transportation was a second factor. The Chicago and Northwestern Railroad opened a line from Chicago to the village of Lake Geneva and on July 26, 1871, and people were then able to reach this area with considerable ease. The third factor was the Chicago Fire, which occurred on October 8, 1871. Many of the families displaced by the fire actually escaped the burning city by getting on the train and coming up here to the lake. Many of those people stayed here at the lake through the fall and winter of 1871 to 72 while awaiting the reconstruction of their city homes. Within a few years, when the city and its industries were back on their feet, more and more Chicagoans selected Geneva Lake for their summer retreats. This half stone mansion is called Glenfern and was built in 1911 for Judge M.C. Sears of Chicago. Judge Sears first arrived in Lake Geneva as a summer resident in 1894, and the home remained in the family until 1934. In the early days, the Chicago Cook County court system had a rather questionable reputation. Upon Judge Sears' arrival here, our local newspaper noted that he was one of the few honest judges left in Cook County. After his death, the estate was sold and partially subdivided, but the main house, caretaker's cottage, and circular barn all remain as private residences. Now this next 1,450 feet of shoreline and the next 20 homes comprise the Elgin Club, which was established in 1873. The Elgin Club is one of the oldest clubs of its type on the lake, and all of the original members were from Elgin, Illinois. The founding of the club is quite an interesting story. A group of Elgin men spent a few days hunting and fishing here at the lake. Two of them lingered for an extra day or two and decided they would like to buy an acre on the lake shore to camp or build a cabin on. The owner of the property agreed to sell only if they would purchase the entire 16-acre parcel. He would not split it up. This was considerably more land than the men had in mind, so they went home to think it over, and they decided they could subdivide the land themselves and sell lots to their friends in Elgin. They came back the following week and purchased the entire 16-acre parcel for a whopping $400. Oh. Uh, rough. Yeah. Yeah. That was 1873. Of course, pricing is a lot different now. At this time, lakefront property out here is valued at anywhere between $30,000 and $60,000 a foot. The lakefront foot times have changed. Colored home behind Pier 130 and continuing down the entire length of the concrete seawall. More than a quarter of a mile is the site of Jerseyhurst, the estate of R.T. Crane. Several large homes have now replaced three of the original four mansions. The main house was built in 1879 and it featured beautiful and unique stained glass windows depicting views of the lake from various vantage points. The home stood where the large white home on the knoll now rests until it was torn down in 1933. The Crane Company, founded in 1855, was for generations the world's largest manufacturer of plumbing supplies and bathroom fixtures. In their heyday, the Crane Company was more dominant in the industry than Kohler is today. The home was very ornate, and uh, when it was torn down in 1933, the, the stained glass windows that depicted various uh, lake scenes here were taken out and put into storage and are now on display at the Geneva Lake Museum back in the city of Lake Geneva with the corner of Main and Hill. Uh, there were four homes on the property, the main house and three others that were occupied through the years by great children. Only one of all of those four remain and that's this Randway Banner that we're approaching now called Windwood. It was built back in 1884 for Mr. Crane's daughter Kate and is now owned by the Griffith family of Chicago. <laughs> it held. That big slide coming down there, that's the largest water slide like that on the lake. 
it has water running down it when they're using it. You come down on the fill of water and you're hitting about 60 miles an hour when you go off the bottom. <laughs>
shoreline is known as Pebble Point or Coleman Woods. It's owned by a family who wish to leave their property as undisturbed as possible. While they built three new homes here in the early 1990s, they have tried to keep a very natural style of landscaping. Here's a chance to get the King County or Neck look to your left and across the lake on the south shore above the treetops. You can see a chunk of land sticking up with light poles on top of it. That is not part of the natural topography there, but rather that's a man-made ski hill. It used to be called Majestic Hill Ski Resort, one of several ski areas in southeast Wisconsin, but Majestic no longer operates. Went out of business quite abruptly in March of 1988 after the main chalet burned. Time is hors d'oeuvres and treats. We'll be back. Hey, these people, yes, but Our next delivery is going to be to Pier 168 up ahead. And tied there, you'll see another of the old vintage like steamers. This is the 87 Fort Long Matriarch, originally christened the Passaic when it was launched here in 1899 for Richard Crane, who's a state jersey nurse we saw a short while ago. Look at that. The Matriarch is recently undergone an 11 year long restoration process which included replating about 40% of the riveted steel hull, as well as replacing the entire superstructure, including the white pine deck, the mahogany cabin, and the canopy. The decorative oak masts up on top are original, as are all of the mahogany stanchions holding up the uh, canopy, the mahogany handrails, the brass fittings. She's powered by diesel, but she was seen. There were 50 of these beautiful bolts here at one time. Only four remain.
beginning with the snack tour palms and extending all the way into Williams Bay is the Cedar Point Park subdivision, the largest on the lake. Cedar Point is divided into eight sections, each having a boat docking facilities and swimming area, similar to the one we're passing. It was set up this way so residents who live off the lake can also enjoy lake rights. When the Potawatomi inhabited this area, Cedar Point was considered sacred ground to them. About 50 feet inland was a large boulder or spirit stone around which they staged their ceremonies. They also believed that the cedar trees that once lined the shore here contained the spirits of departed ancestors. located on the lake with a population of about 2,500 permanent residents, a population that triples in the summer months. It just got warm very quickly in about three days, and the car sank. Who yes. knew? Who knew that that would happen in May slash April here? <laughs> Show us your stringer. 
<laughs> I've never seen anybody catch any fish either. Ooh, I like these. Isn't that beautiful? And these you can get for anywhere from two to four million dollars each. Maybe five. Well, we had to do some window shopping. There's a house on the lake for $11 million. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what that mortgage is. Yeah, it's huge. Ever. Going Every to the year. battery pack? train service being extended from the city of Lake Geneva was to provide transportation to the estate owners who could dock their large yachts here and then be easily transported to their private estates. Boat transportation at that time was more than a luxury. Land travel around the lake was difficult and often impossible even after the road around the lake was completed in 1910. For many years people depended on the private and commercial steamers to deliver guests, customers, and residents as well as goods and services. After the railroad discontinued service to Williams Bay in 1967, the village purchased the lakefront property from the railroad and built a beautiful lakefront park that has won both national and international awards for design. The land behind the railroad property was owned by private developers who for the next 20 years attempted to dredge the wetlands and build a resort, condos, and a golf course. Luckily, the village residents, plan commission, and village board felt strongly about protecting the environment and bought the property with local tax dollars for $1.2 million. Immediately after the purchase of the 230 acres, it was rezoned into a conservancy and the Kishwaquito Nature Conservancy was created. You can now enter the trail system from two locations and there are four miles of trails. Trail maps at the main entrances show access to acres of wildflower prairies, restored woodlands and beautiful sedge meadows to enjoy. We are now in Williams Bay. This is the Williams Bay We're going to be making a brief passenger beach. stop here in Williams Bay to drop off some folks who are leaving us now. You folks who are getting off here and work your way down here to the gate. Uh, everybody else can remain seated during the docking procedure. In case we bump the pier, we don't want to knock you off balance. We'll get underway again in just a moment. You can see along the beach the new bathhouse that was recently built there to replicate the old railroad depot that used to stand along there. in Fontana. Right. Not Williams Bay, Fontana. They're Fontana. Two, different, two different things, two different cities. Should we talk about our new fake show that's coming here live from not so Fontana? Well, we are also... The Michelle Show? The Michelle... The, the Stewie Michelle Show? Yeah, the Stewie Michelle Show. It's gonna we be, have uh, a new parody show called the Stewie Michelle Show. Yes. Yeah, coming good. out soon. We see... Be, Wait, hold up. We gotta show them. We are now letting people off. We are in the municipal here, which this is public. You pay money to park your boat and use it. Now we have somebody getting their boat free to go in. It is usually slammed in the summertime. But it has been Look at that boat. That boat's got to be a couple. Uh, I think that's a cobalt. Beautiful boat. Not the, not the, the, not the boat 
that's going in right now, the boat that's about to go in. I wonder how much that is. It's got to be a hundred. It's got to be more than that. Well, that would be about one hundred twenty-five, one hundred fifty thousand dollars boat. Uh, just chunk change. Not it must a be nice to, you know, have that kind yeah, of Yeah, all these boats deliver the, uh, the flotilla of money to the homeowners. They just bring up cash. Oh. Yeah. Another thing about Gage Marine, I am just a useful <laughs> of knowledge. Gage has some people that they people call them. Hey, I want my boat, and they will deliver the boat ready for you to go in the water. Yeah, which is astonishing, and they'll only do it two times a, a summer, but they'll storage and everything, which is quite interesting. Yeah. They store all of their boats within the vicinity of Lake Geneva or Pontiana, Williams Bay. It kind of just depends on how much money you want to spend to have your boat within the vicinity of Geneva Lake. So we are now going back on the lake. We say goodbye to everybody. Let's go back to showing them the lovely Williams Bay area. Williams Bay is also home to several restaurants, including Pier 290 that will see in a second, Cafe Calamari Cartoon Willie's, and Daddy Maxwell's Cafe. If you're visiting the area, take some time to visit this quaintly short village. Again, I'm going to remind everyone that just many of the folks that are on board want to hear the narration. Now, we realize you have visiting to do, and fine, do that, but some of you are getting so loud, we can hear you all the way up here. And so, and some of the folks are unable to hear what's going on. So we'd appreciate it. Uh, keep your visiting fine, but keep it down a little bit. We appreciate it so much. Those two blue gray buildings are the Bayshore condominiums and our next deliveries to these two large brick towers. Those are Bay Colony and Bay Colony South condominiums built in the 1970s. is the home office of the Gates Marine Corporation, Gates Pier Service, the Lake Geneva Cruise Line, and the brand new Pier 290 restaurant. This is where the excursion boats are kept in the wintertime. Late in the fall, after all the private boats are out of the water, the excursion boats are pulled up to these docks and they're tied for the winter. They're actually left right in the water. They're covered with large canvas covers and then circulators are placed in the water around the hulls to keep the ice from forming. There's a marine railroad on the premises capable of handling any of the boats in the fleet, including the largest boats, the Bell of the Lake, the Lady of the Lake, and the Walworth. Periodically, we must haul, must haul each one of the boats out of the water for bottom painting and other major maintenance.
Pier 290 is the year-round destination here on the lakefront. There's inside seating for 70 people with outdoor dining right on the lake's edge for approximately 100 guests. Cozy fireplaces both inside and out are designed to create a four-seated dining experience for people who arrive by boat or land. In addition to the Pier 290 restaurant, the renovated marina also includes a wooden boat center where boats are custom built, restored, serviced, and sold. If you bring your ticket from today over to the Pier 290 restaurant, you do get $5 off of your meal. The home behind Pier 296 with the five arch windows was built in 1890 for P.J. Healy, co-founder of the Lion Healy Music Publishing Company. Mr. Healy was a strong supporter of a variety of charities and even donated the magnificent pipe organ to St. Francis Catholic Church in the city of Lake Geneva. Most notable scientists who have visited Yerkes are Albert Einstein and Edwin Hubble. 